CO2 Research Center. And we're very pleased to have here today uh, Alan Hatton. Um, Alan has been in the faculty at MIT for uh, four decades. Um, started in uh, 1982 in the chemical engineering department and did a um, lot of uh, great work. And especially in the last few years, well, work on colloidal, um, colloidal solution suspensions and also separation processes. And especially, I would say, in the last decade, Alan uh, mostly focused on um, separation processes, especially involving carbon removal and CO2 capture, and uh, which is the topic of today's presentation. Uh, in particular, uh, Alan uh, started working on um, electrochemical processes for CO2 removal, and one of the latest achievements is actually the, the starting of the company, Verdox, that is uh, one of the pioneering companies in the field of um, electrochemical CO2 removal. Uh, so today, Alan will be talking to us about asymmetric chloride-mediated electrochemical CO2 removal from ocean water. And uh, very pleased to have you here, uh, Alan, today. And thank you so much for your time, and we'll look forward to your talk. Good. Well, thanks very much for the invitation, Matteo and Ji Wong. It's been a pleasure to be here. And I really enjoyed the last talk. Uh, mine's not going to be quite as uh, information-rich, but I hope to give you some indication of what we've done over the last year or two in a new direction for us in terms of looking at uh, ocean water treatment. So basically, I think we all recognize that temperature rise, the global temperature rise over the last few decades in particular has been quite dramatic. And we got well over a one degree rise so far. And this has been leading to um, major uh, wildfires and other kind of drought, flooding, and so on, major climate uh, problems. This has been attributed to the fact that the, uh, the temperature rise has been directly correlated with the amount of CO2 that's been emitted over the past uh, a couple of, uh, a century and a half. And we talk, we show here that there's uh, been um, the cumulative CO2 emissions and the temperature rise associated with those. So there's a very strong correlation here that needs to be addressed. If we don't address this, what we have is the fact that uh, if we continue business as usual, by the turn of the century, we're talking about a temperature rise on the order of four to five degrees Celsius, which would be cataclysmic to say the least. And therefore, we need to think of some ways in which we can have different, uh, mitigate these effects. And there are a number of different mitigation studies that have been discussed by the IPCC and other people and, and other reports and indicate that we do need, we can sort of ameliorate this to some extent by adopting appropriate mitigation uh, strategies. Now, where does all this carbon come from? Well, if you think about the uh, the industrial use and the fossil fuel and combustion, about 35 gigatons per year are emitted uh, from the anthropogenic sources. And there are also other uh, sources of uh, CO2 as well from land use changes, agricultural activities, and so on, which gives us around about almost 40 gigatons per year of total emissions in the system. Now, these are not, uh, don't remain in the environment. About 11 of these uh, end up going back and being uh, absorbed by terrestri terrestrial sources. And another about 10 gigatons per year are taken up by the oceans uh, each year. And this gives a total sinks of about 22 gigatons per year. That means that you're accumulating a CO2 in the, in the atmosphere around about 19 gigatons per year. And this is what's leading to the global temperature rise at this point. Um, so we, as we pointed out, if we go business as usual, we're talking about four degrees Celsius in the system uh, rise, but we would like to mitigate this to we can restrict the rise to about 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, if at all possible, which means that we need certain emissions uh, uh, strategy, carbon emission mitigation strategies. These can be from non-carbon renewable resources, solar, wind, hydro, um, nuclear, you name it. Um, but there's also a major issue in terms of recognizing that there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere already, and we are not going to be able to mitigate everything uh, just by using non-carbon sources. We are going to need to look at carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And to do this, there are a number of different things we can look at. One, of course, is we can do the power the point source capture we had a concentration in order of about 4 to 20% CO2 in the uh, gas stream that need to be treated. Um, there's a lot of interest lately in the last two or three years, maybe four years, it's suddenly been taken off dramatically in terms of looking at direct air capture, where the concentrations are a couple of orders of magnitude lower than in the uh, point sources, which means that capture technologies are a little bit more difficult. And then if you want to think about the fact that there's a lot of CO2 that's in the ocean in the presence of dissolved inorganic carbon 
primarily bicarbonates and then carbonates, uh, we recognize that there's some opportunities here as well. Um, if you think about direct air capture, the concentration of about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 milligrams per liter concentration in the air, but in the oceans, it's around well over 100 times more concentrated. And some folks think that this could be a good reason for us to treat the ocean water as uh, there's um, a, far, a far less volume needs to be treated. Of course, the treating water versus treating gas can be uh, add some complications. So what we want to think about is the ocean acidification. One of the issues we have with the uh, CO2 absorption is that it, it acts as a sink, an absorption sink for the CO2, but also leads to ocean acidification, as we are well aware. And what we find is we get the carbamate formation and then going on to the carb, uh, bicarb well, bicarbonate formation, then going on to carbonate formation. This has led to uh, some significant changes in the pH or the overall pH in the area. And we can see that it's gone down around about a tenth of a pH unit and just over a short uh, period of time here. And this has led to some significant impacts on the overall um, uh, um, uh, uh, seawater environment and so on. This is shows like a reef that's actually being uh, decomposed and simply because of pH change and temperature changes. If we continue going historically, if we continue going in this uh, direction and not do anything about the CO2 emissions, you're talking about very dramatic uh, decreases in the pH, absorption of CO2 decreases in the pH of many, many tenths of a pH units. And that's going to be catastrophic uh, for the uh, overall ocean environment and survivability of our marine life and so on. Indeed, this is uh, indicated here. We're looking at the dissolved inorganic carbon in ocean water. Uh, this is under condition in, in equilibrium with the air. Um, if you get about two million, uh, two million moles of dissolved inorganic carbon, most of it's in the form of bicarbonate, some of it's in the form of carbonate at the typical pH of about 8.1 or thereabouts. But if you have any minor changes in the pH, minor acidification, and we move further down here, we can see that we are actually ending up depleting our resources of, uh, of the carbonate, which can have a very big impact on the marine life. And indeed, you can see in this particular range is where we're seeing the changes in the pH. And you can see the speciation changes are quite dramatic, even with very small changes in pH. So what we like to think about is, can we actually mitigate this to some extent and uh, recognize that we can remove CO2 from the ocean water by reacidification, adding additional uh, protons, they're driving the the, uh, the reactions in the opposite direction. So we're going to change the carbonate to the bicarbonate and then back to a, a molecular CO2 that can be desorbed and taken off in the, in the gas phase. And therefore we can do some ocean water decarbonization in this way. This is uh, some advantages that are claimed for looking at direct ocean capture are that there's a high CO2 concentration. It's much higher than the atmospheric CO2 levels. It's basically, you can think of this as being a, like a major big gas contactor. And typically you use absorbers or something else to capture the CO2 from direct air. In this particular case, you don't have to worry about the absorber design at all because the ocean is acting like one big absorber. Um, there could be some other advantages too, in particular, if you can co-locate these near uh, aquaculture farms or things like that, that you can do some regulation and pH uh, adjustment for aquaculture too in the systems. The question is, how do we go about doing that? Well, the current technology that's been looked at and even commercialized now, well, commercialized, you know, sort of a major pilot plants being developed, are looking at uh, electrodialysis and pH swing. In fact, I think all ocean capture processes are using some variation of this, in which one uses a bipolar membrane as shown here uh, to do a catalytic splitting of the water. The catalyst are inserted here between the uh, anion and cation exchange membranes. Um, no, sorry, cation anion exchange membranes. And therefore, we can then, uh, the water is split, we can have the proton go in one chamber and the hydroxyls to the other. In this particular case, we acidify the ocean water that's fed to the system and we can release the CO2 as a medical CO2 and take it off. On this side, of course, what you're doing is, is make it more basic. And if we have carbon, we can form, uh, form calcium carbonates and the like that can then be recovered if we want in this side. 
And these are normally driven by a reduction in oxidation reactions, oftentimes by formation of hydrogen and, and oxygen in these systems, which means that you get some parasitic reactions going on. Alternatively, you can use these redox couples as shown here, in which we get the reduction of the ferrocyanate here. And uh, in this case, and the other side, we've got the oxidation. So we can actually drive the actual uh, overall uh, current through the system that will drive give us the uh, the uh, separation we need. But these do require membranes. They do require, um, and they do generate uh, gases and other materials. They are also, or well, they need other chemicals like in the ferrocyanate as shown here. So what we're looking at is other approaches that could be used. Uh, let's think about using electroswing pH modulation. Uh, what we want to do here is actually use an electrochemical cell in which we have electrodes that are redox active in the, in the uh, in, in, in operation. And so the idea here is when we apply an appropriate potential, what we get is oxidation here and you get the protons being released by these electrodes. You're not generating the protons by water splitting per se, but by chemical uh, electrochemical reactions at the electrodes themselves, releasing the protons. And to a counter, counter side, we will release chloride ions uh, in solution. So once we do this, what we've got is acidification of the water and that releases CO2 as a gas or a molecular CO2 that can then be drawn off in a contactor and uh, drawn off as a pure CO2 stream in principle. Um, once you've got the, the now the CO2 depleted stream can then be sent back to a second cell where we do reverse the reactions, we recover the protons and the chloride ions, and then return the ba more basic solution back to the oceans. Uh, obviously, what's going to happen here is it's going to be a cyclic process because at some point you're going to run out of protons on these electrodes and uh, we're going to load these electrodes up, etc. at them with protons. And we just reverse the potential, reverse the flows, and uh, we can go through in a cyclic type of process. This is one particular rendition, we think, of one way in which you might be able to do this is have these units on um, on the platforms as shown here where we can do uh, take the ocean water, uh, treat them as such, we then uh, take the captured CO2 and uh, maybe eject it at depth or do uh, do some uh, other uh, the conversion with the CO2. And then the, the uh, alkali water can then be sent back to the ocean, so we increase the alkalinity of the water. And if we can co-locate this with aquaculture farms and things like that, it'll also help counteract some of the acidification caused by the growth of uh, mussels and oysters and things like that. But the important part about this approach, it, uh, there are no membranes needed, there are no chemicals needed, and we have very low voltages. Uh, electrolysis needs a voltage in quite excess of uh, one volt, uh, which is uh, quite energy consuming. In our particular case, our voltages in general could be quite a bit less, as I'll show you. Now, uh, we've done some thermodynamic modeling of these kind of processes just to show you that we uh, this is, uh, we, we are able to do the thermodynamic modeling, just looking at the various components in solution. At this particular time, you're not worrying about the, uh, uh, the minority components uh, such as uh, magnesium and calcium and things like that, uh, magnesium and calcium, yeah. So, um, the, the actual electrodes that we've chosen in this particular case are a business electrode for the one side and a silver electrode for the other. In the business, what happens is a re business reacts with chloride in the presence of water and undergoes the reaction to form the business oxychloride. And in so doing, it releases or generates the protons as shown here. Uh, to balance this from a chemical perspective, we need to have another source of uh, anions. And at the silver electrode, a silver chloride electrode, what we do is get the reduction of that to give us the silver and then the, um, the chloride ions to balance the, the hydroxyl, uh, the hydrogen ions that are, are produced. And we can actually look at the energetics of this process by considering the Nernst equations. Uh, this is the Nernst equation describing the, uh, the, uh, the potential of the electrodes and the equilibrium conditions, depending on the activity of the protons and the activity of the chloride ions. And similarly for the, uh, um, for the silver electrode. From these two, we can actually determine what the actual potential is or the voltage across the cell would be to drive this particular uh, separation. And that can be written in terms of the chloride and the proton uh, activities.
If we plot this, we can see the voltage as a function of the applied charge. The applied charge is basically dependent on how many electrons we transfer and therefore on how many protons we generate. And during the acidification, we can find this particular relationship as shown here. And uh, in the voltage, uh, the every generation, we get this relationship between the cell voltage and the total amount of charge that's been transferred. And from looking at the thermodynamic perspective, the area in between these two curves provides us with the total work under ideal conditions needed for this uh, particular application. And typically the theoretical minimum energy is around about 32 kilojoules per mole, which is, is, is very low. Um, of course, we'll never achieve that, but uh, it's certainly a big goal to strive towards. So let's just think about the thermodynamics of the pH regulation. Again, we've got the same kind of process. We've got release of protons here and absorption of protons there. If you look at the concentration of the applied charge, what's going to happen in the acidification side and this side here is uh, we're going to start out with the speciation of the carbonate, the bicarbonate. And as we add more and more protons to the solution, the amount of CO2, that molecular CO2 that's uh, generated goes up and uh, the amount of the bicarbonate carbonate, of course, goes down. And this particular point, if you've got the molecular CO2, which can now be disengaged from the aqueous solution, by uh, drawing a vacuum or using a sweep stream of an, an um, inert gas. Uh, the pH regulation is really important in these systems, and this shows you how the pH would change as we apply charge. Uh, in the acidification side, what we do is we have a pH in this particular case is shown just going down to about five, which is more than adequate to release all the CO2 uh, as a, um, a, a molecular form. But on regeneration, you see that the uh, pH goes up quite dramatically because there's no buffering effect of the carbonates and things like that at this point. So the pH goes up to about 10 and a half to 11 uh, units as shown here. Now that could be problematic and because uh, it could lead to some uh, precipitation of uh, materials such as magnesium or calcium hydroxides and the like that can lead to fouling of the, mem of the electrodes. But that's something we leave for another day. We think we know how to uh, handle some of those problems but we still need to verify them. So if you look at operation in a batch system, what we find is the current that we have in this particular case during the CO2 release step or the, um, uh, the, um, the, the uh, acidification side, you have a current there. And then on the realkalization step, we, re we have the opposite current, uh, the reverse current as shown in this particular case. Uh, and what you see is the voltages change depending on where we are. So if we have a particularly low voltage in this case uh, across the cell, very low during the acidification, but it does increase quite dramatically uh, during the realkalization uh, process. And this is the actual voltage swing that one would have to use on around about 0.6 volts, which is, is a very, very reasonable uh, voltage for the system. It can lead to fairly low energetic requirements. If you look at the individual uh, electrodes, what the uh, potentials on the electrodes are, you see that there's very little change in, in the uh, voltage uh, for the uh, silver chloride electrodes, which means a very almost reversible process. There is some significant uh, drop in the voltages here and or increase in the voltage required. And this is because of some of the very sluggish kinetics associated with this particular um, reaction going back to the bismuth. And uh, the pH changes we've shown here and uh, the amount of CO2 released. But I want to talk about cyclic operations when you've got two cells operating in tandem. The one cell would be uh, operating in the acidification range. The other cell would be operating in the uh, alkalization range. And then, as I said, we would need to take a rest, structure the cells around and go through that. This is one particular cycle. We see in this particular case, we're getting acidification of the voltage here is go down uh, around about uh, what, point, point 0.1 there. And here it's around about 0.7 in the second cell. So this is the uh, acidification and the alkalization cell. We can then change the cells around, flip them around, and so uh, this now becomes the alkalization and this becomes the, um, the uh, acidification cell. So basically show that we can do this in a cyclic fashion. And the important part is what kind of pHs are we seeing in our system. This particular, uh, under these particular conditions, we see that we are able to generate in each cycle a fairly consistent uh, acidification of the solution uh, going through that particular cell and also the alkalization 
of the uh, of the uh, re alkalization of that water stream in the second cell. So that's what you've got is the, this uh, a cyclic process. The overall release energetics, I think that's an important consideration is what are the actual energetics of the system. First, let's talk about the released CO2. The amount of CO2 that's released per cycle is shown here. And you can see it's fairly constant. Um, it's very, very steady. And the fraction of the CO2 removed in this particular case is pretty well close to 100% in, in such a situation under these conditions. Um, the actual Faradaic efficiency is important in how many electrons are actually being used effectively uh, for the capture of the CO2 uh, or release of the CO2. And this is a relative uh, Faradaic efficiency and the average is around about 90%. So you're getting about 90% uh, uh, electron efficiency in this process. The energetics are such that we get about 120 kilojoules per mole. Uh, which is a, a very, very good number relative to what other folk have been reporting for the um, bipolar membrane type electrodialysis, which would be on the order of 150 to 300 kilojoules per mole. So we are pretty uh, excited about having these kind of uh, numbers in the system. We had stable operation of at least 10 hours. Of course, this is not enough to show the long-term benefits of the system, but we do have a relatively low energy expenditure under these kind of conditions. So um, let's just talk a quickly about the concentration pH evolution in the flow cells. I can look at the flow coming into a cell as shown here, the chemical cells. We've got a certain amount of charge transferred as we move through the cell. And uh, we've got this length L of the cell. We have a current density, et cetera, et cetera. We can calculate the actual, we, can, we, we know what the Q is, uh, the, the um, pH and concentrations are as a function of the amount of charge transferred. And we can then re rearrange this to give us the actual distance traveled to give us a, um, a certain amount of charge transferred. And in fact, this is what we see, a concentration profile in the axial position, depending on the total amount of charge that's transferred in the system. And you can see that basically with low, low, low um, amount of charge transfer, we don't have much of an impact. If we have a lot of a charge transferred, uh, obviously uh, we're gonna be able to get to our, our situation of releasing all the CO2 uh, long before we actually get to the end of the channel and therefore it's a waste of time. So uh, we can see that's the case. So we can then sort of regulate the size, the length of the column based on the amount of charge transferred and the, uh, the concentration that we want, the final concentration that we want in the system. And we can look at the same pH as well. So basically at very high so the total charge, applied charge, we can get down to pHs on the order of three, four, five in this particular case, which may be a pretty desirable in some instances. And indeed, if you look at the exit concentration, the concentration here as a function of a total applied charge, we get this, and as I said before, you get to a point where you, you're applying more charge, but you're not doing any good. Uh, but you are also decreasing the exit pH as shown in this particular case. And there seems to be a sweet spot then in terms of the total applied charge that one wants to apply in the system to get a reasonable exit concentration and the pH change. So um, let's think about the pH regulation in the regeneration cell. Um, what we can think of is shown here, the pH in the solution as a function of applied charge with five degree of acidification, and then the regeneration uh, here. The, so the regeneration is a problem that we have because in large, large pHs, we can get the electrode fouling and other, uh, other concerns that could happen. So we really want to reduce the amount of uh, pH increase in the uh, regeneration cells. We have a few strategies to look at that, but um, I'm not gonna talk about them all. Uh, just one way we can do this is by actually mixing that, that uh, treated water with just pure Asian water, so you've got some degree of buffering capacity and sending that through the cell here, you also increase uh, decrease the residence time. And that's the case that you can actually modulate the pH that's leaving the cell or in, in the cell as a function of, of uh, the, mat, the, the relative ratio of the uh, ocean water to the actual treated water as shown here. In this particular case, we can in principle uh, modulate the pH increase and therefore avoid some of those filing type problems. One other issue that needs to be addressed is uh, looking at oxygen and nitrogen issues. There's a fair amount of oxygen and nitrogen that are in the um, in the ocean water, of course, 
And uh, what happens is when we go through the, the process here, uh, if you do a, if you pull a vacuum to pull off the CO2, you're also pulling off oxygen and nitrogen, which is very strongly problematic. So a way in which has been proposed that you, one addresses this by others uh, is that you can actually uh, degas the, the uh, seawater before you send it to the treatment cells, and therefore you get pure CO2 coming off. But still comes off in a vacuum because the partial pressure is only about 0 0.07 bars when it's been, all the DRC has been converted. And therefore we can then uh, do have additional compression with costs associated here as well. So um, the techno-economic analysis, the quick techno-economic analysis uh, is, shows that if we look at just the electrochemical cell itself, forgetting about all the other ancillary processes, which are really our, our energy hogs, just look at this particular system, we can think around about getting about 50, 60, 70 tons of dollars per ton of CO2. And this is really what you do is you have to compare this with other kinds of uh, systems uh, that are out there. And that is something we are looking into right now. So in summary, I'd say ocean capture of CO2 is certainly a feasible operation. A bipolar membrane uh, water splitting for acidification is, uh, is now established as a, a viable method. And the are folk, particularly at Caltech and Delft and other places that are actually looking towards commercialization of these processes. So they do require expensive membranes, uh, cat catalysts and so on. And, but they operate in the continuous conditions or can operate that continuously. The electrochemical modulation that we've been talking about, um, we don't need membranes or chemicals and no gases are generated. They are cyclic operations and so on. But uh, the considerations we have here is, of course, that the, it's common to all approaches that we do need pre pre filtration of the ocean water being treated because we've got very large amounts of colloidal and, and larger materials such as fish. Uh, that need to be filtered out. We need to pre-degasify pre for oxygen nitrogen removal. And our CO2 that needs to be removed under vacuum because it's such a low partial pressure, even when it's fully um, liberated. Uh, we have ways we think we can avoid these other two, these two steps, but I can't talk about those at this point, and they're still under investigation. We also need to be concerned about filing of the electrodes and membranes. And as our RPE uh, sponsor says, we also got to be worried about permitting issues. And then finally, we can think about co-location of these uh, processes with desalination plants, aquaculture uh, facilities, etc., etc., etc. With that, I'd like to finish up and acknowledge the work that's been, that people have been working on this project. And in particular, I want to say that Sony Kim is the main driver of this project at the moment and did most of the experimental work we've been talking about here today. And RPE has been funding this for the last 18 months or so. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alan. Wonderful.